So, the big question is this. How are pitching coaches like us, who aren't lazy and driven by our ego, who actually care about getting every player better, how do we coach in a way that lets us break free from the status quo, see things differently, and impact each one of our players for the better, all while changing the landscape of this game? That is the question, and this podcast will give you the answers. My name is Andy Powers, and welcome to the Pitching Secrets Podcast. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Andy Powers here, and welcome to this episode of the Pitching Secrets Podcast. And instead of you listening to my boring self every day, we've got a very special guest as part of this uh, this episode. I'm really, really excited to have him. This is somebody that, uh, you know, we've got a lot of common mutual friends, but we've never really had a chance to ever meet. We've spoken uh, in the past, but uh, this is the first time we've ever been able to capture the things that he uh, he believes in uh, on uh, on video or on uh, audio, depending on which way you're getting this uh, podcast right now. And uh, his name is Gary Reinel, and Gary is part of been in the sports medicine field for over 40 years. Uh, he's been, he's a consultant for over 100 professional teams, including all of Major League Baseball. Uh, he's the director of pro teams for Mark Pro, which if you're not familiar with Mark Pro, we're going to talk about it in this podcast. Um, he's even been invited to the White House to speak with the president's personal medical staff and, and, and kind of talking and learning more about the things that this episode is going to be about. He's the author of three different books, including the one we're going to talk about, which is called Iced. Uh, he's known as the anti-ice man. And if you've been with me for any period of time, you know how I feel about ice as well. Uh, so Gary, welcome to the show. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Andy. You, you bet. So, you know, there's so many things that we're going to try to cover today. It's I'm really excited for this. Um, and as, as everybody knows, I think you and I have even talked about it, but, uh, you know, I iced when I played. And if you would have asked me why I did, I don't know. I would just said, well, that's just what you're supposed to do, right? Because that's what, that's what dad, that's what coaches told you as well. Um, so I wanted to kind of just start with a little bit of a foundation, if you will, of, of where a lot of this started before we start diving maybe too deep into your stance on this, which has also become my stance on this. Um, but this all started with a doctor named Gabe Merkin, right? And he's kind of the father of what we consider to be called the RICE method, R-I-C-E. Uh, could you explain just a little bit, what is the RICE method? The RICE protocol is arguably the most recognized recommended protocol in Western medicine. It means rest, ice, compression, and elevation. And its purpose from the people who believe in it, uh, and it's a belief, it's not a legitimate stance, it's just a belief, yeah. is that it's going to help the body heal and help prevent further damage. It's not true, it actually does the opposite. And it's one of those great errors, it's probably the uh, when I look back and I say all the things I've seen in my life that have been just flatly wrong, the Rice Protocol qualifies as one of the top things. Uh, when you rest, ice, compress, and elevate, what you do is literally trap the waste in and around the damaged site and prevent the natural flow of oxygen and supplies. Clearly not something that anyone who knows anything about the topic would recommend, and yet, it's one of the most recognized protocols in Western medicine. It's been around for quite a while, hasn't it? About 40 years. Now, 1978, Dr. Merkin uh, wrote a book called The Sports Medicine Book. Right. And he coined the phrase rice. Uh, and the re he really simply described what was happening in the marketplace, though. It, it started back in 1962 with a young boy by the name of Everett Knowles who hopped the freight train. He was 12 years old, hopped the freight train in Somerville, Massachusetts, and in excitement and cheering for himself, uh, hit a stone abutment, ripped his arm right off. And when he fell to the ground, he thought he broke his arm, but in fact, he had torn his arm off. And as he got up and lifted his arm in his jacket, he walked up the hill, and some fellows at a, a factory saw him and quickly got him over to Mass General, where a young doctor there by the name of Ronald Malt made a decision that changed the history of sports medicine. Now remember, it's 62, so sports medicine is not here yet. Yeah. But this still influenced it. So here's what happened. They had to get a group together to accomplish a task that, 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 that Dr. Malt suggested. He said, look, we got a perfectly healthy 12-year-old and a fully intact arm. Let's sew this thing back on. Well, today that's common 
belief. It's, it's simple. Back then, hadn't been done yet. Mm -hmm. So they had to get together the people who could do that. So they get an orthopedic surgeon, a neurosurgeon, and they get the different people to come into the hospital to help with this. Well, here's what happens. There's a gap. There's not text. There's not, there, there's no way to get there. There aren't cell phones. None of that stuff exists. So you got to go get the people. And while they were waiting, Dr. Malt made the decision, made the order, gave the order, put that arm on ice. Now, why would you put the arm on ice? Well, it's not attached to the body. A lot like if you go to the fish market, you see the fish are all on ice. Well, why? Because it helps slow down the rotting, the decaying. So Dr. Mald had the same idea when he said, put the arm on ice. Now, why did that matter? Well, because when he put the arm on ice, he slowed down the decay while they're putting the team together to sew the arm back on. So now they get everybody in the room, they sew the arm back on. Sure enough, the blood flow returns, the hand starts to turn pink and everybody's excited. Well, this makes worldwide news. And when the young boy left the hospital and waved to the crowd, it made worldwide news. And when he caught his first baseball or whatever that action was, it made worldwide news. This was a big deal. In fact, Dr. Malt traveled the world lecturing this topic to other physicians for years following this procedure. Remember, it had never been done before. So they didn't know what to do. What, in what order? What do you do? Do you put it on ice while you're waiting to put the team together? What, what exactly do you do? Well, here goes where the problem begins. When asked what should we do if this happens in the future? Remember, before you threw the arm away, there was nothing to figure out. So now people are asking, well, what do we do if this happens? The response was this, remain calm, don't panic. That became rest. Keep the severed body part out of the sun, out of the heat. That became ice. Use a tourniquet to prevent a bleed out with the intact part. That became compression. And elevation was simply the fact of putting the severed part, the, the remaining part above your heart to slow down the flow. So the RICE protocol, rest, ice, compression, elevation, has nothing to do with managing damaged musculoskeletal tissue. It has instead to do with preserving a severed body part and preventing a bleed out. It's a complete miss. Wow. It didn't matter that it missed people heard the rice protocol that Dr. Merkin named in 78. Yeah. And it caught on, rice is nice. And anyone who went through school from about 1982 or so on, learned rice is nice, rest, ice, compression, elevation. Everybody knew it, we all did it. And that's why it's the most recognized, recommended protocol in Western medicine. It's simply one of those things that should never have happened, but it did. Now you might in the audience be thinking, well, who's he to say that? Well. Just hold on a second, because I'm going to tell you. The doctor who made it up, Dr. Gabe Merkin, mm -hmm. after he read my book, Ice, the Illusionary Treatment Option, publicly recanted, said I made this up in my 1978 sports medicine book. Research has clearly shown I was wrong. Don't do it. It delays healing and then gives a specific reference to the fact that it causes additional damage. He not only publicly recanted, he then wrote the foreword to the second edition of my book. So I got the doctor who made up the most recognized recommended protocol in Western medicine to not only recant, but to write the foreword to the book that took down the protocol. That's incredible. This is why guys, this is why I want you to stay through this episode because you can hear a lot of people have their positions on some things, but when you hear this position that Gary's got, but then you hear that the position that he holds, which has been the direct opposite of what the, you know, the father of this premise was created and that guy changed his mind and said, you know what, Gary's right. This, this is going to be so much fun here. So that's a, an incredible story about the boy who had his arm ripped off when it, as I understand it, and please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but it's, as I understand it, that it kind of started to also make its way into baseball when a picture of Sandy Koufax surfaced where he like, I guess he was after a game and he had a, his arm in a bag of ice or something. So uh, it's, a, it's in a bucket of ice water. And in a bucket Joe, of ice. Oh. So Joe Bula was the head, was the trainer at the time. He wasn't the head trainer, but he's the okay. trainer in the picture. And I never got to speak to him. I, I regret he died before I got there, uh, before I knew to find him. Uh, but the picture does exist. And the picture's, I think, in 65. So it's a couple of years later. Mm -hmm. And that had nothing to do with recovery, though. Huh. It had to do with they were injecting 
likely Novocaine, not sure of the drug that was used back in those days. I can't find a history of what they shot in them, but likely Novocaine at that time period. And he said, uh, Kofax said to him, find another way to make my elbow stop hurting because I ain't doing the needles no more. They hurt too much. So they put his arm in a, uh, like a wetsuit type sleeve and they put his arm and his elbow in a bucket of ice water. And that picture went, let's just say, viral for the yeah. time, remember, because it, yeah. viral had, was not viral to now. Right. It's a very well-known picture. It's a great picture, by the way. You can look it up uh, if you Google Sandy Koufax, uh, arm in a bucket of ice. It'll pop right up. And it exists, but that wasn't the start. And it wasn't for the same reason. So it's kind of confusing. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the rice protocol idea is making its way through the network of, of the society. And the Kofax picture had nothing to do with recovery whatsoever. The Rice Protocol had something to do with treatment and recovery. It, it was wrong, but that's what it was for. Kofax's picture had to do with making his elbow stop hurting. That's all it had to do with. And by the way, putting ice on it does make it stop hurting. It doesn't solve the problem. Right. It doesn't get rid of the reason you have pain. It right. simply shuts off the signals that alert you to harmful movement. And that's actually a bad idea, not a good idea. Real bad idea. P well, people often think, well, if I make it stop hurting, isn't that good? No, that's not good, actually. Make the reason it's hurting stop. There you go. Not make it stop hurting. Yeah. And so here's why that matters. If you make things stop hurting, but you don't solve the problem, now you have a false sense of security and you're liable to do things. In fact, many, many doctors and therapists actually recommend, well, make it cold, and then go do your exercise. And that way you'll be able to gut through the exercise. It's like, no, that's a stupid idea. Stop that. Why, why do you think things like that? You don't shut off the signals that alert you to harmful movement. Yeah. And then go and do harmful movement. Right. So a simple thing to ask is, if you had a broken collarbone, something simple for everybody to visualize, a broken collarbone, and you couldn't sleep. So I made it numb with a bag of ice for you and you fell asleep. And the whole time you were sleeping, you were, distra you were distracting the fresh fracture site. Do you know anybody who would recommend that? Well, you see, if you didn't make it cold, when you got in that faulty position, you would have woke up and said, hey, that position hurts. And you would have gone back to a neutral position that doesn't hurt. You don't want to shut off the signals that alert your harmful moment. You want to solve the problem. You want to get rid of the reason you have pain. You do not want to mask the pain. And I liken the use of ice for pain control to the sympathetic bartender that gives the alcoholic a drink so it can temporarily feel better. Did it help? Maybe. Did it solve the problem? Of course not. Did it make things worse? Possibly. Probably. If you left it on long enough, yes. So it's like, well, then why would you do that? because that's what people do. They don't, they don't think it through. And, and the typical medical response, and I've been in this business for since 1973, so and I'm up getting near 50 years now. And what I can tell you is this, nearly everybody believes take something and make it stop hurting. That's why you see pain medication on, on commercials. If you watch TV at night, you'll see it. Hey, take eight of these a day and you won't have any more pain. It's like, stop it. Why do I have pain? Yeah. Fix the problem. Now you might say, well, what about if I can't fix the problem? Well, you know, if you can't fix the problem, there are better ways to do it than ice and drugs. You can do electronic anesthesia and electronic anesthesia will give you the pain relief without the side effects. And you won't become addicted to it and it won't make you sick and constipated. And it doesn't cause additional damage. So there are other ways to mask pain, but I rarely, if ever, recommend it for a young athlete. Young athlete has pain, fix the problem. Don't make it numb. That's so good. That's, that is so good stuff. Because, you know, the pain is an indicator that something is wrong. Your body's trying to tell you that there's, there's an issue there that we need to be addressed. So this, I'm going to kind of jump ahead because this is a question I have for a little bit later on down the line. But And, I, and basically, you've already answered it. But I... I know, having you know, still being heavily involved in in the baseball training and, and industry and the things that we're doing, it is almost without conscionable question. So many players are are doing the icy hot, or they're doing the ibuprofen, or you know, or stuff like that. Sometimes they're even doing it. A lot of times they're doing it before they go out and throw to mask the pain, just like you were talking about. 
And I always cringe when I see that. I, you know, anytime I have a chance, I tell them that is a horrible, horrible idea. But you explained it a whole lot better uh, than I than I do right there. So, well, let me ask you this: aside from the severed limbs and and all that, because I know that this is a question that's been posed to me a few times. As we start diving into the the ice and the and 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 not the the benefits of or the non benefits of it. I know that some people have asked like, well, what about ice baths? You see a lot of athletes will do like an ice bath. They submerge their body. Is there any benefits at all to ice as, as far as you're concerned? Well, I want to answer that and then keep this the whole time. The things I'm saying are not my opinion. Mm -hmm. I'm stating facts. So what I did, I'm a reporter. I'm a teacher. I went and read everything organized it, and then interviewed hundreds of the most recognized, accomplished athletic trainers, physical therapists, physicians in the country. Yep. I went all over the country from elite military bases to the Yankees and the, and the LA Lakers. You can name it. I went everywhere that if you, if you were important, I tried to get into you and I've got into almost everybody. Yep. And once I was, had the first hundred or so, the rest became easy because people were like, oh, you talk to him too. Oh, you're sure. Come on in. So I went and I asked people, what are you doing and why? How's this working? Well, what are you trying to accomplish? And how are you doing what you're doing? So people say, well, what do I think? I don't want to think. I'm a reporter. So I'm going to tell you what the literature says. The literature says if you go in an ice bath after you train, it'll dampen vascular muscular adaptation. Now, if that's your goal, to train hard and then dampen the results, yeah. well, that's a good idea. It'll work. Yeah. But people I know who who say that ice baths are good and they're, they're allies of mine they're anti-ice people but they say but gary people go in an ice bath and they say they feel better afterwards fine if, if you have a belief you know placebo is very real yep. if you tell me that you feel better after you do it and you like the discipline because there's discipline in going in an ice bath if you ever had the pleasure of doing it you don't just do it happily you go in and it's miserable so there's discipline and that, that's good. Discipline's a good thing, not a bad thing. So if you're going to do an ice bath, don't do it when you train. So if you're going to train at four in the afternoon, go in the ice bath at six in the morning. But don't train at four in the afternoon and then go in an ice bath. You've just, you've just neutralized or, or you've reduced the results, the stimulus that you just provided. And that's right in the literature. Here's the problem with it. That's not convenient. So people say, well, you know, but, but the ice bath's available right after practice. Okay, well, just realize that you're going to dampen your, your benefits. So if you're going to do it, then realize that you're making a mistake. Is it wrong? Not like icing an ankle. You know, you roll your ankle and you ice that for two hours uh, in, in the course of the day. That's a bad idea. Jumping in an ice bath for 10 minutes, it's just, it's uncomfortable. Uh, if you find that it's, makes you feel things if you say you feel better when you're done i'm all for it go ahead and do it have a ball just don't do it after you train interesting yeah that's 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 a good point so i think we're probably now to the point where we we've 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 laid that great foundation that that uh, people are listening to and they see okay uh, i'm i hear where you're from you're not a fan of ice it makes sense so if ice isn't the answer what is the answer well, the same thing, it's always been the answer, and that's active recovery. The okay. body is designed to self-repair, not self-destruct. In order to self-repair, you've got to load the tissue. There's a great article, if anybody is interested in reading it, uh, and, and some people you know, really do like to get into the details. Well, the details are there. It's in a paper called Loading by Buckwalter. And if you go on my website, GaryReynolds.com, I have a paper called Healed, where I explain his paper. Now, what that means is you don't have to read his paper, which is a clinical journal article, to understand what he said. I wrote it in English for you. However, I give you all its references, so you can go and read his too if you want. But if you want to read a version that's in English, read mine, and then go and read his if you want more. And when you read that, you realize that the comment that he makes in the beginning of the paper, one of the most important discoveries of the century, the paper was written in 99, one of the most important, 1999, one of the most important discoveries of the century 
is that the loading of damaged tissue facilitates the healing of muscle, bone, ligaments, and tendons. If you are still, stillness is the enemy. If you are still, you're not providing the stimulus for the healing. So it is a gross error to do anything except for active recovery. And that really goes back to the whole question here of, well, how do I figure this out? Well, very easily, just stop and ask yourself, what's your goal? So for example, before you put a bag of ice on, uh, let's say something simple, a, a ball bounces off the plate of a foul ball and nails you in the shin. So why would you put a bag of ice on it? Well, uh, you're trying to make the tissue cold. Is that your goal? Well, no, not particularly. Well, so but that's what it's going to do. Do you want to slow down your circulation? Well, no, I don't think so. Well, well that's what it's going to do. You want to compromise the flow of oxygen and nourishment to the damaged site because that's what it's going to do. So you have to go back a step. You have to say, what are you actually trying to do? What's your goal? Well, my goal is to, how about if I help? Take my goal, and if you don't like it, change it, rearrange it, however you want to. But I'm gonna give you a goal that I have thought through after many thousands of hours and conversations on this topic with experts in medicine. You're trying to prevent further loss and regenerate that which has been destroyed. So that's it. You're trying to prevent further loss and regenerate that which has been destroyed. That's all you're trying to do. So what you do, all you do is match it up to that. Does it prevent further loss? Does it regenerate that which has been destroyed? If it does, it's probably a good idea. If it doesn't, then you have to rethink what you're trying. So rather than saying, I'm gonna put ice on it, I'm gonna sit still with a bag of ice securely strapped to the area and then stick it up in the air. Instead of that idea, which clearly does not prevent further loss or regenerate that which has been destroyed. But to get to that point, you kind of, you need a little bit of help. So here's help. And by the way, anyone in your audience, if you're a coach, if you're a player, if you're a parent, some of the smartest, most accomplished medical people in the country never heard what I'm going to say right now until I said it to them. So don't feel bad if you don't know this. And the reason I know it is because I'm a reporter and I go and I figure things out and write things down and read things and organize. Here's what causes further loss. Congestion in and around the damaged site. Swelling, you might call it. But that congestion will build and build and ultimately suffocate and kill otherwise perfectly healthy cells that were not involved in the initial trauma. So you've got to decongest the area in and around the damaged site. So let's stop and ask a simple question. How does it decongest? Well, it doesn't evaporate. It can only go back to the passive lymphatic system. So how does the passive lymphatic system work? Well, by activating the muscles in and around those vessels. In effect, you milk the cow backwards. So when the muscle contracts, it presses against the lymphatic vessel and pushes the waste up a chamber. That empty chamber now has negative pressure that pulls waste out of the interstitial space and so on. So you milk the cow backwards. So that's how it evacuates. So now let's ask a simple question. Do you think that sitting still, which slows down cardiac output, with a bag of ice securely strapped to the area while sticking it up in the air, which slows down cardiac output or slows down vascular flow even more, which slows down lymphatic flow even more. And then when you compress it, it slows it down even more. So do you think that sitting still with a bag of ice tightly wrapped to the damaged site while sticking up in the air is going to move waste through that passive lymphatic system? The answer is clearly no chance. Yeah. So why would you do that? That's not going to solve that problem. Okay, so the first issue of further loss is the congestion. You've got to get the congestion out. To do that, you've got to activate the muscles in and around the damaged site. And you do that in a very simple uh, protocol. Use your brain, never cause pain. That's it. There are no exceptions. Use your brain, never cause pain. And you say, well, how do I do that? you activate the muscles in and around the damaged site. Now, you can, when I grew up, back in the late 50s, early 60s, I think I beat you by a generation by the look on your face there. Uh, but back in my day, we were told by the coaches and the parents who were involved in sports, <coughs> walk it off. Don't sit still, yeah. it'll tighten up, keep moving. 
Well, we didn't know why walk it off worked, but we knew it did. Today, we know why it works. Because when you walk it off, you activate the muscles in and around the damaged site, which milks the cow backwards. So you say, well, that's pretty simple, but walking it off sometimes hurts. That's why we recommend something different. In medicine, if you talk to anyone who's in the business, they will tell you, for example, about your ankle or your shin, they would say, do ankle pumps, where you kind of wiggle your foot like this, and it's called an ankle pump. And it works, it, it works very well, actually, if you do it long enough, yeah. and if you contract enough muscle. But there's another way of doing it, you can electronically walk it off. And if you electronically walk it off with a non-fatiguing electrical stimulation device, now you're going to accomplish the walking it off, but you're doing it electronically. And it's point specific. So I can do just your left lateral quad. I can do just the bottom of your right foot. And that becomes a great advantage in the process of walking it off. Walking it off, by the way, didn't start in my generation back in the late 50s, early 60s. That's been that way from the beginning of time. We've always walked it off. We only stopped walking it off when the Rice Protocol became, became popular. That's when we stopped walking it off. Wow. I never heard of sitting still with a bag of ice tightly secured to the damaged site. My entire sports career, no one ever once ever said, hey, sit still with a bag of ice tightly wrapped to the area so that uh, you can trap the waste in and around the damaged site and prevent the natural flow of oxygen supplies. No one ever said to do that. Yeah. But in 78, it started. So now you've got this issue of, well, what else causes further loss? Well, it's very simple, disuse atrophy. And what happens in disuse atrophy is muscles and other tissue begin to shrink. And when tissue begins to shrink, it's called atrophy. Well, atrophy is the result of disuse. That's what disuse atrophy is. Yeah. So here we have disuse atrophy. And we've got this problem going on when we say, well, how can you prevent that? Well, if you load the tissue, you activate the muscles in and around the damaged site, you can prevent disuse atrophy. So you get how simple this is? It's like, so the same muscle activation that decongested the area also prevents disuse atrophy? Well, the answer is yes. And then on top of that, another category of loss is faulty scarring, which causes adhesions that will cause you to lose functional range of motion. And if you've ever had the pleasure of having faulty scarring or adhesions and having them broken in therapy, it is a miserable experience. It brings tears through everyone's eyes. It's yeah. nasty. Well, why does that happen? It's because you didn't reorganize the repaired tissue. So there's three steps to healing. Inflammation, repair, remodel. Now, that's not my opinion. That's right out of the clinical textbooks, by the way, for anyone listening and taking notes right now. It is three steps, inflammation, repair, remodel. If you do not remodel the repaired tissue, you will develop likely faulty scarring. Now you say, well, so how do you reorganize the repaired tissue? By loading the tissue. So the same loading technique that Buckwater talks about in his groundbreaking paper in the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons in 99, the same loading that decongests the area in and around the damaged site, the same loading that prevents and retards tissue atrophy, the same loading will simultaneously reorganize the repaired tissue. And that's your three big categories of loss. You've got the suffocation and killing of otherwise perfectly healthy cells that were not involved in the initial trauma. You've got the disuse atrophy, and you've got the faulty scarring that causes adhesions that cause you to lose functional range. So there are your three big categories of loss that I just took care of. Now, here's a big question. Do you think that sitting still with a bag of ice securely wrapped to the area while sticking it up in the air is going to decongest the area in and around the damaged site, prevent a retard tissue atrophy, and reorganize repaired tissue. Just in case anybody got it lost here, no. no. It doesn't, it won't, there's not, no. In fact, that's so absurd that no one even suggests that's what happens. And yet that's the protocol they recommend to manage the problem. And I believe the reason they do it so wrong is they never identified their goal. See, as soon as you have your goal established of preventing further loss and regenerate that which has been destroyed, 
everything becomes simple to put in place. So let's look at regenerating that which has been destroyed. How do you do that? What's, what's, the, what's the idea to solve that problem? Well, uh, if you've ever been hurt, then you know that you often get what people call bruising. Now, it's called different things clinically, but bruising, but the black and blue marks you see under your skin uh, after you had trauma. Well, what is that? Well, that's blood that has leaked out of vessels that were broken. So that means the network, the vascular network is now compromised because everybody's not where they belong anymore. So what do you have to do to regenerate that which has been destroyed? Job one, you got to rebuild the related vascular network. So how do you rebuild the related vascular network? Oh my gosh, you're not going to believe this. By loading the tissue. The same loading, the same stress that decongests the area in and around the damaged site, that prevents and retards tissue atrophy, that reorganizes the repaired tissue, simultaneously stimulates the rebuilding of the related vascular network in and around the damaged site. Now, there's one last thing on, in the rebuilding process that's very important. It's called myostatin. And myostatin elevates when you're inactive. So what that myostatin does is it inhibits muscle regeneration. And it's kind of smart the way it's figured out because if you're doing nothing and you begin to atrophy, that's your immune system, your, 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 your innate intelligence controlling, saying, hey, we don't need these muscles anymore, let's get rid of them. So it begins to atrophy. Simultaneously to that atrophy from the lack of use, your myostatin levels elevate. Why? Because if you were atrophying over here on this side, you clearly wouldn't want to be regrowing over on this side. So your myostatin levels elevate. Myostatin inhibits muscle regeneration. This is going to be the shocker of the day. You'll never guess what lowers your myostatin levels. Active recovery, loading the tissue. The same loading that decongests the area in and around the damaged site, the same loading that prevents or retards the disuse atrophy, the same loading, the same loading, nothing different, the same thing reorganizes repair tissue. The same loading stimulates the rebuilding of the, re, of the uh, related vascular network in and around the damaged site. The same loading lowers your myostatin levels. Now, if you go to a clinical textbook, you will not find what I just told you because I'm who figured that out. Now, does that mean it's right or wrong? No, I just had to go to 30 different places to get the information to be able to tell you what I just told you. I was challenged by a doctor not long ago, and the doctor said, well, Gary, you make it sound too simple. I said, doc, it had to be simple or we'd all be dead. You understand that if we had these five things you need to do, decongest the area, prevent or retard tissue atrophy, reorganize and repair tissue, rebuild the related vascular network, and lower myostatin levels. If there were five different stimuluses required to make that happen, we would all die. We'd die of a broken toe. It doesn't work that way. It's the same thing. Walking it off, the coaches, the parents were right back in my day since the beginning of time. We are designed to self-repair, not self-destruct. And that's contingent upon loading the tissue or active recovery. So good. So good. And just a real quick on this one to, to, to take the load part just one step farther for everybody listening to understand. When we're doing that load, there should be no pain in the load that we're doing, correct? So, I mean, we can do things, but if you're experiencing a pain while you're doing it, it's probably too aggressive or too heavy for what you're doing. Or you're not doing the right thing or you're not doing the right thing. So, so my rule is blanket. I never alter it. Use your brain, never cause okay. pain. Right. I, don't, I have no variation of that, of that recommendation. That's beautiful. So here, so, so are you surprised like where it seemed like it, like the baseball community just accepted this premise a long time ago so quickly and then have been absolutely so resistant to accepting something different it's been so slow to change. Has that been any kind of a surprise to you? I've always said baseball itself is kind of a very archaic game and it's slow to change. Um, and, and guys like you that challenge that are, you know, you, you sometimes get a little pushback, you know, from the general community. But is that any kind of a surprise to you? Well, honestly, when I started in, with Major League Baseball teams, um, now all 30 Major League teams use my 
recovery technique. Um, I have confirmed well over 200 major league pitchers using the Mark Pro, for example. Now that's confirmed from the head trainers emailing back to me when I simply asked how many of your guys are doing it so I can give you guys all a list of what's going on. Yeah. So that's a real number. It's over 200. Uh, I'd say it's closer to 250 because I know when the, when, the, when the survey was taken with them and I know how many I've added since then. So I'm saying here, first time publicly, I'm very confident it's 250 or more, but I have confirmed from the trainers over 200. So here's what happened. It was really very simple. I had no intention of changing Major League Baseball's practice with pitchers. Yeah. I had no intention. Anyway, who would dare have such a thought? <laughs> well, I'm going to go in and I'm going to change the way they manage their pitchers. No, that's, that's not right. what happened. Right. I got a call from a team, from a head trainer, and he said, Gary, we got a guy falling out of rotation last season. It was in January. And we're wondering... <laughs> <laughs> we're wondering what you think, you know, we should do, you know, what do you say we should do? And this is about 10 years ago. And I said, well, um, how about if I come and see you? So I went up, met with the trainer. We went over to the player's house. I can't say who the player is because he's never publicly admitted it. Uh, but I will tell you this, if the player is listening, here's what he said to me the first time he saw me a year later. He said, Gary, I love your machine. I take it everywhere I go and use it every time I throw. Now, if he would just say that publicly so I could tell you his name, <laughs> I'd be thrilled. But I can tell you this, he lasted several additional years in the majors and he was falling out of rotation when I first met him. So when I got there, I simply asked a question. I said, what are you doing now? And they said, well, we had three throws. We put a bag of ice tightly secured around his shoulder for 30 to 45 minutes. If his arm still bothers him tomorrow, we do it again. And I said, well, stop doing that. And they said, what do you mean? I said, well, you just said that's not working. So stop doing that. Okay. Was that complicated, what I just said? No. <laughs> <laughs> did, did, did I trip you up there? Yeah. It's like, what you're doing isn't working. Stop doing that. Right. Said, well, what should we do? I said, well, why don't we rely on how the body actually recovers and rely on active recovery and activate the muscles in and around the damaged site? So we did. I hooked the player up right there in his house. I put the pads in the, the strategic area of his body where he said he gets tired and sore. And turned it on and immediately his arm was flopping in the air like this. And it was, oh boy, that's not gonna work. So I said, okay, look, do this. Give me that pillow. I put a pillow between his arm and his torso and kind of had him sit relaxed sitting back. And that took away the bounce that I was causing by my activation. And it was far more comfortable and I was able to activate much more fiber. And the rule is this, the more fiber you attract, the less time it takes to accomplish a given task. Mm -hmm. So I knew in the first two minutes that my initial idea wasn't going to work because it was too messy. There was too much bouncing around and that's not what you want to do when you're trying to work on someone and get them recovered. If you tell me you want to exercise them, well, that would have been a good exercise, but I wouldn't recommend what we were doing electronically. So that player then listened to me and did what I said, and it worked. And through spring training, he told one of his, uh, I, I believe, an old roommate at another team. And that team ordered one. And then someone else heard about it, and they ordered one. And then a team ordered 10 of them. And that first year, I picked up maybe, I'm going to make up my number because I don't really know it, but eight or 10 teams. Uh -huh. The following spring training. I added almost everybody. And today, all 30 major league teams, and I believe it's safe for me to say that all minor league teams also use the Mark Pro. Um, but I, I don't know that for certain because I mostly deal with the rehab coordinators for the minor league. And then, so say there's six minor league teams and they buy 12 machines. I'm assuming each minor league team got two, mm -hmm. but I don't know that. So I'm teaching everyone I can teach. I do not know for certain that every minor league team has it, but likely every minor league team also has it. And well, then yeah. in all sports, over 500 collegiate teams. So what ends up happening, and, and by the way, also the military. So, but here's what happens with all of this. 
I have so many people, meaning the military uses our technology. They use our prescription version of the product. When I look at what's going on and, and you ask me, well, how do you get people to do, how'd you shift it? I didn't have to do anything. It was organic because everybody who was doing it the old way that was falling out of rotation or not feeling good, they flipped to me because I was a different idea. So they tried my, hey, that worked. And then I, my big breakthrough came through uh, years ago, I guess four or five years ago, uh, when Corey Kluber started using my product. And Corey was an anti-icer. Before he met me, Corey didn't like ice. So I lucked out. I got an anti-icer who you gave him a way to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did an interview with Corey, and it's, it's on my website. If you, if you Google uh, Corey Kluber, Mark Pro video, it'll pop right up. Or you can post it on your site if you want. Uh, and Corey started using it, getting very good results for what he was looking for. Remember, he wasn't an ICER. And when I did the interview with him, Corey says, it, I'm paraphrasing, but I'll be real close, but you can go and watch the video, hear his real words, but it's something like this. He said, I don't ice, never ice, don't like ice, makes my arm feel stiff. I no. used the Mark Pro, my arm feels the best of my whole career. You have a chance to do this and you don't, you're making a mistake. Are you kidding me? Did one of the best, this is before he won his second Cy Young Award, by the way. Yep. One of the best pitchers in the major says he doesn't ice, he does this, and if you have a chance to do it and you don't, you're making a mistake. Okay, well, guess what? I have all 30 teams now. So is it because of Corey? There is no doubt Corey's influence was very significant in pushing that next, let's just say, 100 pitchers. But all the rest have fallen in line, not because Corey said so, and not because I suggested it, but because it works. Because active recovery is the answer. I call that ARETA. So instead of the RICE protocol, I have the ARETA protocol. Active recovery is the answer. Because it is. Walking it off has always been the answer. Now we have a way to electronically walk it off. Amazing. So, and I know like at, at Texas Pitching Institute, I mean, we have several Mark Pros and I, I almost feel like sometimes our guys rush through their training just so they can get to that hookup and <laughs> use it. Um, but I, I don't want to get away from this real quick because you, you talked about it, you touched on it when you were talking about the positioning uh, with that player, you know, in trying to relax him. The more relaxed you can be in your position, the more tissue you're going to recruit, correct? More muscle you'll create. Oh, more muscle yes. you're going to recruit. Yes. So the, the the wherever you're hooking it up. So let's start. Let's let's talk now. Now let's talk about the the, the Mark Pro. Uh, the more the more relaxed, depending on what it is that you're hooking up, the more relaxed you can be of that area, is obviously the better way. That that's what we're that's our goal in terms of the setup, right? Yeah. So I'll, I'll give you a real example. Um, okay. We had a player who fell asleep on the training table. Uh huh. A pitcher. He fell asleep. And um, I saw him dozing off and I noticed it. So I grabbed the trainer. I said, look at this, watch, 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 watch. And as the player actually fell asleep, the contractions became much more significant. Nothing else changed except for he was no longer resisting my signal. Wow. So you get what happens is if you fight me, yeah. because see the, the technology of Mark Pro, I know everybody who has a product. I mean, I, I get it. It says yeah. theirs is special. But ours actually is special. We actually have a patent. It really is special. And it's unusual in that it's a non-fatiguing contraction. So we use a little bit of energy to get a significant contraction by staying with the tissue for a long period of time. And as a result, we get a big contraction. But if you fight me, I don't have enough power to overcome you. Yeah. So the more relaxed you are, the more fiber I can attract. The more fiber I attract, the less time it takes to accomplish a given task. So given a choice, I don't ever want you standing up walking around the training room with it on your shoulder for if you're a pitcher. With anybody, if it's your shoulder. I don't want you walking around with the machine on. That's not a good plan. Your arm's going to be flopping in the air. It's completely, I don't, I'd rather you not do it than do that. Yeah. Now, so what would be the best solution? If that's the worst, what's the best? Fully reclined in a lazy boy chair with your arm across your torso fingers headed down towards your towards your hip put a, a, a soft pillow or a big sweatshirt between your arm and your torso to absorb the bounce 
and now you've got it. The weight of your arms neutral to the floor, so there's no hang, and there's no flopping because the pillow or the, the big sweatshirt is absorbing the bounce. We're attracting all the fiber and we're good to go. And you say, but, but Gary, I don't have a lazy boy chair. Okay, get as close as you can then. And yeah. stay as far away from you can from the guy walking around the locker room with his arm flopping in the air. Yeah. So you got the two extremes. Don't do that. Try to do this. What do you got? Well, I got a bed. Okay, you that better work. A bed will work. Mm -hmm. A lazy boy chair fully reclined is better. Now, why? Because it's easier to get everything relaxed that way. Can you do it in a bed? Yeah, you can do it. You can get pretty good. Can you do it in a wooden chair? Oh, boy. It's not so simple in a wooden chair because the wooden chair doesn't give and, and it's very hard to stay upright. Now, the weight of your arm is now pulling down, so it's not neutral anymore. I really would need your arm up here, neutral to the floor, but then how are you going to hold it up in the air and you have to get four pillows in there? It, it's much easier to be fully reclined in a lazy boy chair. It doesn't mean it won't work if you were walking around the training room with your arm flopping. It'll work, but you're killing my results. Well, and I can speak from, you know, from direct experience, you know, for the guy, people listening, but, you know, when I was kind of starting getting introduced to the electric stimulation, you know, the, these different things, I mean, I went the hillbilly route and I went to, you know, the local drugstore and got a couple of, you know, those little stem units and, and used it. When we finally made the jump to Mark Pro and got him and I introduced him to my guys, um, I, 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 those other units I originally had, we put them in the drawer and they've never come out again because the guys will not use them. Um, and, and I'm not saying that because uh, of anything, I get anything from our pro. I don't, it's just the simple truth. It's just what our guys, it, it, I mean, they noticed personally to an individual, the, the difference it made them feel um, when we made the switch. Uh, so if anybody's listening, they're sitting there going, well, they're kind of all the same. They're kind of not. And like you said, yours is pretty special. And our guys spoke volumes. I didn't say a thing. I just introduced it to them as an alternative to what we had been using. And, and, uh, and they never, they never changed. No, not a single guy ever said, well, I want to use the old stuff. Never. They would just wait in line for the, for the guy that was using the, you know, when we had all of them were being used, the guys would just kind of wait in line until it was done. And then they would use it. They, it just sounds like you need more of them. I need more of them is what I'm trying to do. <laughs> so now let's, now let's talk about this real quick. Cause now I want to really start getting into it of, of some of the Apple, the, the applications, not only just of the Mark pro, but of the active recovery itself in general, but some of it will overlap. Um, a guy's pitching right now, or he's, you know, either in a game or in a practice, whatever, but he's kind of done, you know, his, his workload today is, is pretty much done. Is there kind of a magic window or is there a, a time frame? Like how soon do you recommend guys start going into that active recovery once they're, they're done with their day for the day? When we're talking about active recovery for when you're tired and sore, yeah. as soon as possible, the okay. longer you wait, the more likely you're going to have more additional congestion and you're going to feel tight. So I'll give you a, an easy example. Say you're a triathlete. You just finished the Ironman. And I put you on an airplane an hour and a half later and make you fly six hours back to the mainland. When you go to get out of your seat, you are going to be miserable. Yeah. And the reason is now you have set so long that everything is congested. And like our coaches and parents told us back in my day, don't sit still, it'll tighten up. Okay, it's gonna tighten up. So if you know the congestion's coming, why would you let it build before you'd manage it? Yeah. And my, my analogy about that is this. I know it won't work very good down there in El Paso, but for the rest of the country, this works. Uh, if you knew it was going to snow 24 inches in the next 24 hours, if you knew it, one inch per hour, if every hour on the hour you'd walk out front with a good stiff broom, you could effortlessly keep your sidewalk clear of an inch of snow. It'd be simple. If however you wait till morning and open your door to 24 inches of angry snow, I assure you it will not be effortless and you will not clear it with a good stiff broom. So if you know it's going to snow 24, 24 inches, why are you waiting? Do it now. Yeah. Well, it's not convenient. Okay, the longer you wait, the more it's going to accumulate. The more it accumulates, the more difficult it is to, to, uh, to clear. So is it, is, it, is it because clearing a larger volume is harder? No, it's just there's only so much room. Yeah. 
It moves one cell at a time through the lymphatic system, so it, it doesn't go fast. So why would you let it accumulate? Oh, I'll do it tomorrow. If you do it tomorrow, you're going to be sore. Mm -hmm. Do it tonight. If you listen to what in Corey Kluber's interview, he says as a result, the next day he doesn't waste the first 10 or 15 pitches trying to feel good. He already feels good. He actually says that in the interview. And it's like, well, wow, is that, can I expect that? Of course you can expect that. See, probably the most important thing to understand is, this is for everybody listening, please stay with me till I say the whole sentence. It's not my pro. It's not the ankle pumps. It's the muscle activation. So you've got to activate the muscles to solve the problem. It just so happens that ankle pumps aren't very practical when you have a bigger problem. And when you can electronically activate the muscles in and around the damaged site, it's just so simple to do it for an hour. If you tell me that I'm going to have to go and, and do shoulder shrugs or go in the pool and go like this with a paddle, or I don't know, back in, the, in a certain time, they had guys running the poles. Uh, that's really hard way of doing it mm -hmm. when I can do just what's tired and sore. And, and uh, I, I'll tell you, uh, I, I believe you and I already talked about it, but uh, to, for your audience, there's some things that people have not thought about with pitchers. They think very, very deeply about their arms when their arms aren't the only thing. Uh, I have an interview with uh, Dan Strelly, who used to play for the Marlins. I played with the A's before that. And Dan uses it on his hips because that's what gets tired and sore on him. He actually says in my interview with him, my arm doesn't get sore. His hips do. If it's hips, what's that mean? You don't have to know what it means. Is it a psoas muscle? Is it an iliacus? Who cares? Point to it. Point to it. Find the most dense area of that muscle. Put the paddle on activate. You're good to go. Yeah. Get that muscle out of tension. So if you're doing your legs, clearly you wouldn't want to be standing up. You want to be lying down. But it all becomes very simple. Just point to what's tired and sore. And then if you, if you think about, uh, you, you want to talk about that thing we, we, uh, that we talked before about the, uh, when, the, when their foot plants? The opposing lower back? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So, uh, you know, you already know this, but a lot of people don't know this, is that when you lift your leg and plant if you don't stabilize that leg when your arm follows through the ball ain't going where you aimed it right i'm telling you right now it ain't going where you aimed it so you say well so what stabilizes it well if you've ever seen a pitcher hit the dirt with with their spike and they slide the ball does not go where they aimed it because the integrity of the entire joint structure was compromised when the foot slid but let's say the foot is firmly planted. Now all of that force runs up your leg, up your hip to your opposing lower back. That opposing lower back, given a choice, I'm checking that first. Yeah. I wanna, how tired and sore are you and your opposing lower back? So for your audience, if you're a pitcher, get someone who you trust, uh, you know, your mom, your dad, your coach, whoever, uh, to, Take their fingers and kind of poke them around your opposing lower back. So you throw with your right hand, it's your left hand, it's your left side. Kind of poke around. And if you find a spot that's really sore, kind of evaluate it and then go over the other side and see if the other side's also sore. And if it's not, you can be nearly certain it's from when you plant your foot and throw the ball. And here's the problem. If you don't manage that tired and sore opposing lower back, it's going to compromise your ability to throw the ball where you're aiming it. And if you do manage it, now you've solved the problem. But here's the question I have for you. Or the, I, I'll tell you the story that actually happened. I think that's better than the way I was going to say it. I had a pitcher, uh, the trainer called me and said, Blank loves your product. And I said, oh, great. Well, shoulder? No. Elbow? Nope. Hand? I mean, I'm running out of places. What? what yeah. if, no, I said, what? He said, it's opposing lower back. And I went, I don't get it. He said, Gary, when these guys lift their leg and they bang it down and they do that a hundred times, 
120 times, 130 times in the bullpen by the time they come out and throw, you know, right. by the time they're ready to go. I mean, there's a lot of banging on the ground. By the way, if you or me went out in the mound and banged our foot in the ground that hard 100 times, our lower back would hurt too on the opposing side. Yep. So it, it, would, it, it, it isn't that they're a pitcher. All of us would have that problem. But so that pitcher was using on his posing lower back. And, and at the time, it, it never crossed my mind what's going on here. But I quickly learned. And then I met a player, a uh, pitcher with another team. I said, hey, I got a question for you. Can I feel your lower back? And he's like, yeah. So I poked it. Whoa, 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 that's really sore there. And I went, well, hold on. I, I mean, on the other side, he said, no, nothing there. I said, so I poked again. And he goes, yo, you got that sore there. I said, well, how long has that been sore? He said, oh, it's always sore this time of year. I said, let me ask you a question. If your shoulder were ever that sore to touch, would you tell your trainers? He said, oh, yeah. I looked him square in the eye and I said, from now on, that's part of your shoulder. Do you get it? It is so important. Yeah. And people never even thought about it. Now, I found out about it because not even, a, I, didn't even I didn't say, oh, let me try to figure something out. No, I got a call. I heard it and I knew it was right. Like yeah. you knew it was right because as soon as you thought about it, you're like, well, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so now look at this. Arm care programs. How many arm, arm care programs include the opposing lower back? None. Yours does. Yep. Does now. So that, <laughs> your, yours does. So, so, but, but you see, it's one of those misses that a player yep. just happened to mention. Otherwise, yep. I wouldn't have thought of it. Completely. It's just, a, here's where I'm tired and sore. Like, wow, what a great way to figure things out. Actually learning because it happens. Can you imagine that concept? Wow. You don't get it from a book. That's not in the book. Yeah. You learn because it happened. Yeah, just just real life. When you're getting into the, the act of recovery, whatever it is that you're doing, let's just say it's with the Mark Pro, you're using that at least as part of it. If if anybody's ever had an experience with it, they know that on the on the unit you can choose your times of 15, 30, 45, or 60 minutes. How do you, does the length of time matter? How do you determine that? Well, my simple rule of, of timing is, is the problem solved. So for example, we go back to Corey's comment. Okay. The next day, I don't waste my first 10 to 15 pitches because I'm already good. Got it. Okay, he went long enough. How long okay. did he go? I don't know, but how, he knows how long it takes. So it might be a little trial and error at the first, at the start. Significant. A okay. And everyone's different and every day is different. Yeah. So if the day you threw 30 pitches yeah, and tomorrow you throw 75, right. it ain't going to be the same. Right. And, and not only that, but, but let's just say that uh, for whatever reason, and I don't understand uh, different pitches. Okay. I'm, I'm not, I'm not in your space. Yeah. But if you threw a lot of pitches that previous day, that were the hard ones for you to throw, mm -hmm. I don't know which is the hardest thing to do. A fastball, I guess. I don't know. Whatever the hardest, whatever it takes the most energy for the pitcher. Sure. Well, you're going to be more tired than the day you threw a lesser number of your hardest pitch. Right. Like I, I talked to a guy, uh, um, I actually believe I, I have an interview with him on, on my website. He was a knuckleballer. Uh, okay. from the uh from the red sox if you said his name i'd know it I'm, I, I, regret it. I don't remember no never no, saying no, a couple, year, couple years ago i can only think of tim wakefield for the red sox right now uh i don't remember his name okay. I, I feel bad because he's such a good guy yeah but but because he doesn't lift his leg that's not how he throws he doesn't have any of those problems so oh. i'm making the point yeah it depends on what kind of style you have. Sure. He just kind of like takes the ball and throws it. So he doesn't have that big foot up in the air, bang down on the thing. And that's the difference that you have to put into your formula of how long. Mm -hmm. I can tell you this, uh, everyone's using it 30. Most are using it 45. So 30 to 45, let's just say in that category. Okay. And there are more than, more than, I think more than many would be a correct way of saying it. 
that are using it for two to three hours. Wow. When they fit big days. Yeah. Now, wow. We're, now remember, we're talking about the, in the majors where guys are doing it really hard. Right. But even some of my collegiate pitchers are on for two hours afterwards. Wow. It's not uncommon for me to hear two hours. So th what they'll do is if they're on the bus ride, if they're mm -hmm. on the plane ride, like if they're flying LA back to New York, okay. there's a good chance they're going to be on for four hours. Now, do you need four hours? It doesn't hurt to go too long because we're a non-fatiguing contraction. So it doesn't hurt anything. And would, did, was the result, did we accomplish our goal in two hours and 13 minutes? Maybe. Yeah. Did he go four hours? Yeah. But how do I know what it been? I don't know because he went four hours. I don't know if two hours and 13 minutes was enough. But yeah. I can tell you, nobody's doing it for 15 uh, and getting a big result from a, a big outing. Now, yeah. you tell me at your facility yeah. where they're only throwing 30, 40 pitches and half of it's instruction and you're working on technique and things, you know, 15 to 30 minutes may be plenty at your uh, facility right. like that. You put someone in a game situation where it's you throw, you're on the bench. You go back out, you throw, there's a delay. You're back out. You're, oh boy, that talk about abuse. Yeah. Now, when 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 you're throwing in your facility, it's completely different. So, 15 to 30 minutes is, is quite possibly plenty at, at a facility, at a train, a pitching facility. But I'd still go back to this. How do you feel? Yeah. So this is the so now so this is kind of spawned some new questions for me all of a sudden. So I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of throw these at you. Two, both of these together, because um, I think they're a little bit related. First question A, but then, but hear them both before you answer. Question A is, do you see any difference in need necessarily between a young athlete, 8, 10, 12 year olds, to the collegiate or, you know, because our bodies have more now matured uh, and all that. And then secondly, you know, and I see it a whole lot here, you know, when you get that athlete between like the 12 to 14 year old range, that's kind of that average time where they're hitting that one of their growth spurts. And all the time you'll see guys, you know, that bone on the inside of their elbow, that, that, that growth plate there, it really, that starts to bother them. Is so, so it's happening because the muscles, ligaments, tendons are, are being stressed and stretched because the bones are expanding and growing. They're, they're growing. If we're trying to recover and help to regenerate in that recovery process, during those growth spurts with the younger kids, is it actually a good idea to possibly just hook them up to something like this to have that active recovery to help those tissues, possibly just through the stress of growing to to kind of help regenerate faster? Does that happen? Does that make sense? Questions fair. I think we dropped two clinical just then. Um, I, I would rather answer that with the. Uh, athletes, orthopedic surgeon. Okay. And, and say, okay, here's what this product does. Yeah. Do you believe this would be useful at this time? And there's a lot of factors that could be involved with that, that would be inappropriate for me to respond. Sure. Okay. Um, now, with that said, if you are tired and sore and you want to decongest the area in and around the damaged site, then this will work. Okay. But I don't know if growth plates and stress and tissue stretching, mm -hmm. that's a whole extra question. And that might push us over to the clinical side of, of our technology. And then we'd be using the H wave instead of the Mark Pro if okay. it became a clinical question. And that came so close to clinical that it's, it'd be inappropriate for me to answer over the air. Fair enough. And that's cool. All right. Is there any benefit to using something like the Mark Pro before competing or practicing that day as maybe part of a warm up? Well, I, I try to get all the pitchers to use it before. Really? And, okay. I, and I, I have not been very successful. Um, they have warm up routines that they've been going through since they were young. Right. Uh, some since they were 10 years old. You know, so that's what they do. And don't mess with it because I put this my right sock on, then my left sock, never my left, then my right. Yeah, it's and more. They of have this thing. whole thing they do. Right. Um, but what I say to them, if you have a spot that is tight on you, that you like to warm up, 
I can do it for you electronically and get the exact spot. So why wouldn't you use me? Well, the uniform's on. Got to get underneath of it. You got to put a pad on. Yeah. It becomes maybe more effort than than everyone's willing to do. But I can tell you, I won't say his name because he again has not said publicly. But there is a, a very well known pitcher in the majors that uses it between innings. So while he's pitching, he keeps it on in between innings to keep his muscles warm. Wow. Now, should you do that? I wish everyone did that. But I, it's, it's just not practical. Yeah, yeah. But, but should you do it? If you tell me that your muscles are getting tight because there's lack of blood flow to the area because you're sedentary, and I'm telling you that I can give you that blood flow to the area and keep the muscle warm. Yeah. So I can definitely give you what you're asking for. And is it better than you sitting there wiggling your arm going like this? Well, yeah, it's way better than that. But this doesn't require pads and a machine hooked up to you. So if you'll do it, I would definitely do it before, uh, before I do it, before I throw. Um, I can tell you who does do it before they, and that's uh, track and field. They okay. put on their hamstrings all the time, especially guys who have had, and women who have had hamstring issues. Uh, they'll use it before just to get it warmed up because how else are you going to warm up your hamstrings? Yeah. What are you going to do? Yeah. You're going to go, you're going to go run. That's not practical. So you put it on and you pump out your hamstrings. They get blood to them and you can feel the blood coming in. Yeah. It isn't like, it isn't a mystery when you activate your muscle from your load to tissue, it increases the blood flow. So we're increasing the blood flow to the area by active recovery. And that helps to warm the muscle up. Now, does it make them run faster? I didn't say that. I said it makes them feel better. Right. So I don't know if it makes you run faster or not. And I'm not claiming it does. But if you tell me you're trying to warm something up and what you're, what you're doing isn't very effective, then I'm telling you the Mark Pro will do it for you. Fascinating. So um, we'll kind of finish up with this. Of course, this is, and I told you this the other day on the phone, but to me, this is one of those conversations that, I don't care who you are, when you're presented with the information that you've done today, you can't go back, you can't change. Even if you're a diehard, like I'm, you're, you're an ice guy and this is what you do. When you hear this, you can't deny it. And then if you choose to still not accept it, then that's your personal choice and you're gonna do it. But my point is like, you're kind of never gonna be the same. So. I know that we've also just kind of really scratched the surface of, of what you've got. You've got your book, Ice. You have, um, you know, other resources to be able to to have people learn more about this and learn more about you. So how do they do that? If they want more of this, they want to get deeper on it. How do they do that? Where can they go? Well, I'll give, I'll give you a great place to start. Uh, there is a magazine called Inside Pitch yep. by the American Baseball Coach Association. And the article, all you got to do is Google uh, um, ICE, Pitcher's Arms, American Baseball Coach Association. So you go ABCA mm -hmm. and just put that in. The icing article will pop right up. And in that article, you will see uh, the whole story uh, with some major league trainers who are speaking. Uh, the former uh, head coach for the USA baseball team, uh, the guy who I believe he's in charge of now, uh, strength and conditioning for Major League International, uh, the head trainer for LSU uh, um, collegiate baseball, mm -hmm. uh, um, Randy Sullivan, who is a, a guy from uh, the Florida Baseball Ranch. Great quote from Randy in there, by the way. Again, he goes off of the, you know, use your brain never cause pain. He has his own version of that, but we all, it's, it's the right answer. You had the right answer. I have the right answer. However yeah. you're saying it, Use yeah. your, get rid of the pain. Don't, don't mask it. Uh, Ron Wolford's quoted yeah. in that article. Uh, Rudy uh, Garbalano, I think is how you say his name, a coach from uh, Lynn University over in Florida, who's a board member of the ABCA. Mm -hmm. Why I say that is it is likely the best article. No, not likely. I know everything written. It's the best article ever written on this topic. And you can get it for free. Just go to ABCA anti-ice article, uh, Lindsay Barra wrote it. Uh, Lindsay Barra is uh, Yogi Barra's granddaughter who is a professional writer, yeah, yeah. Uh, writes for, uh, for men's health, for Major League Baseball, 
uh, com for ESPN. Uh, she was a senior editor there, a senior writer there. Uh, so this is a very high end quality article and it's, it's presented by the American Baseball Coach Association. So go read that. So don't believe a word I told you. Go read that. <laughs> and when you read that, you'll be like, well, wait a minute, all these people are saying the same thing? Yeah, all of those people at that level. And by the way, mm -hmm. probably half of those people are board members of the ABCA. Yeah. So this isn't like we just got a bunch of guys, you know, you know, off a construction crew to make some comments about not icing. No, this is the top of the heap. And we're coming back and we're saying to you, it's wrong to ice the godfather of the ice age, the harbor train dock that made up the rice protocol has recanted, wrote the foreword to the anti ice man's book. That's me. Then on top of that, all of that, we've got some of the top people yeah. in the industry in major league baseball off of ice. And they're talking about it. So it's over. The ice age is over. What I say is the meltdown continues, but the ice age is over if you are trying to defend using ice on a pitcher after he throws. It is absolutely unacceptable. It's wrong. And sometimes people say to me, well, Gary, you know, can you give a little bit of room there? No, no, I can't. Here's the reason. A very important reason for all the parents listening right now. Let's say you have a high school uh, pitcher. Good, real good. Likely going to get a scholarship to play ball at a school, maybe D1, D2, at scholarship, to go to school, to go to college. Yeah. And about in February or so, uh, his arm starts bothering him. So his coach tells him to ice it, the trainer tells him to ice it, his teacher tells him to ice it, his mom and dad tell him to ice it, his doctor tells him to ice it. So the kid starts icing it in the morning. At night before he goes to bed. Even wakes up sometimes in the middle of the night and puts ice on it when he falls back asleep. We've now caused a greater problem, not a lesser. We're not solving the problem. We're masking the, we're masking the pain. We're not solving the problem at all. All he's got to do is show up on the mound in April and have a good performance. Doesn't have to win. Doesn't have to strike everybody out. Just show good discipline on the mound, good character and he's going to get an offer. The scouts are in the stands. They plan on making an offer at the end of the game, but the ball ain't going where he's aiming it. He's all over the place. He gets frustrated. He's kicking the dirt. He's angry. He doesn't get the offer. Not because he wasn't good enough, but because he was mismanaged for a month and a half prior to his, to his look. Yeah. Okay, so that kid, instead of going to school and playing baseball, no offense to anybody who does this, but instead of going to school and playing baseball on a scholarship, is stacking shells at the local grocery store. Yeah. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to be quiet and I'm not going to be soft. When we're talking about changing a young man's life because you mismanaged them, I'm speaking up and saying, that's not acceptable, don't do it. If you're still icing a pitcher's arm, either change, or get out of the business. You don't belong here anymore. You, no one has a right to take that kid's dream away. And yet they'll take it away and it'll happen again this year. All too often. I think that is a great way to wrap this up. That's a great message, very powerful. And uh, Gary, I appreciate everything that you've done on this topic. I appreciate everything that you've done to help continue to get the word out and especially appreciate you being a part of this. and. Uh, uh, spending some time with us today on this and, and sharing it with my audience of people. And, uh, you know, of course, if there's anything I can do to continue to help sound that megaphone that you've created, um, you know, I'm there too. So thank you for being a part of this. I appreciate that. And if anybody wants to get a hold of me, you can go to GaryRinal.com. Just my name. If you put in the Andy Iceman, you'll find me. And on my website, you just contact me and I'll get back to you. All right, guys. So I knew this one was going to be a big one, and uh, I, I'm almost uh, I'm almost scared to now shoot my next one. That's just going to be me again. But <laughs> but uh, I really hope that you guys got a lot out of it. Check Gary out. Make sure you're looking at his stuff because it's incredibly good. It's is it, he takes a he 
can take a complex concept, uh, concept and make it very simple and for us baseball coaches to understand. And that's what the, one of the things that I appreciate the most about it. So, uh, all right, guys. So I will see you in the next one. In the meantime, thank you for being a part of this episode and we'll talk to you soon. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Pitching Secrets Podcast. If you want to learn more secrets to enhancing your pitching coach abilities and add to your playbooks, all while breaking free from the current status quo of today's coaching, then I want you to join me in my movement to becoming a pitching boss. To start, I'd like to give you a free three-day masterclass for pitching coaches. In this masterclass, we will take a deep dive together on arm care, creating your daily routine, and developing your pitching staff rotation. Go to bullpensecrets.com forward slash masterclass and sign up to get started today.